All right, so you touched on the fact that you played here. You played in this building. You were the, part of the original package for the Utah Grizzlies and winning the Turner Cup. And just t talk me a little bit through that. Like, what was that like coming through here and, and being part of that? Well, I, I think you have to touch on the year before in order to really grasp what it meant to play in Salt Lake because we were the Denver Grizzlies the year before. And I believe the NHL had a vested interest in making sure that the New York Islanders fielded a very strong IHL team because there was interest in maybe relocating an existing NHL team and bringing them to Denver if we could be successful and show that there was a hockey market there in Denver because they had been there in the late 70s, early 80s and failed. And the NHL didn't like to go back to places where, the, where it was bad news. And we had an unbelievable team. I think we lost two or three times after January 1st, counting the playoffs. So we just waltzed through that league, but we had NHL players on that team. And it was, I won't say the word easy, but it wasn't difficult to win that championship. Now, the Nordiques come in, Quebec becomes Denver, and they go on to win the Stanley Cup in their first year in existence in Denver following our Turner Cup. So now we needed a market. We needed to go play somewhere. And our ownership knew there was a vacancy here in Salt Lake, able to work out a deal, and we came in. But we only had maybe six, seven, or eight players that were coming over from the championship team from Denver. So it was going to be a lot more difficult. So we go into a new market, new team, new arena, new players, major turnover. And could we compete for another Turner Cup? And that was all that was on my mind at the time when I first got here to Salt Lake. I didn't realize there was only six or seven core guys coming over. I, uh, I remember Tommy Salo and yeah. you. And, but, I mean, can you run through some of the guys? Because there's some legends yeah. on that team, yeah, including sure. your coach, right? Yeah, yeah, Butchie Goring. I uh, loved playing for Butch. Uh, you know, personally, I was at that point in my career where it was winding down. My NHL days were behind me. My job was to, you know, help cultivate the younger players, teach them how to win. But she just wanted me healthy and ready to go April, May, and June. That's all that mattered. That's all that mattered to me. You know, the, the regular season statistics did not matter. I didn't have to play every game. So I was in a real sweet spot in my career as far as that was concerned. But, yeah, so I played on a line with uh, Nicholas Anderson, spectacular minor league player. Should have had a a very productive NHL career, gifted skater, puck handler. He didn't last the whole year, but that's who I started off with. I played with him the year before, along with Kip Miller the year before. But guys like that got opportunity because they were having success. They were winning championships. They were young in their careers. They could go play somewhere else. But on defense, we had a guy like Cody Deneen. He's our captain. What do you have, Seven, 800 games in the National Hockey League? He's a great leader. Uh, scary, you need too. That. He's yeah, scary. Yeah, and he, and he played the game the right way, and he played hard, and he played tough. And, he was everything you wanted in a leader, in a, in a quality defenseman, hockey player. Didn't care about statistics. He was all about team and winning. And, and that's what you want in your leaders. Uh, <clears throat> so we had, and then we would have a guy like Scotty Arneal, now the coach of the Winnipeg Jets, you know, a pro's pro. Like he was very important to our success in the postseason. Bobby Beers, who works with us, the Bruins, does the radio. He's been doing it for 25 years, I think. And, uh, he was a big part of our defensive crew back there. I, I could go through every player because I've been talking about him for the last three days <laughs> since I've been here at Salt Lake. But, right. but Tommy Salo, you don't win without him. We made a big deal with Vegas where we got a couple of key players, Raji, Rogers, who scored the game winner. Oh, and, no. you know, if you think back to the final, we swept Orlando, but three of the four games were overtime. Yeah. You know, that was not a walk in the park. And, and, and I appreciated the championship in Salt Lake more than Denver because it was so much harder. You know, we didn't have the star players. We just had guys that were good hockey players. Chris Taylor, another guy that's a lifer, yep. you know, part of the coaching staff on a number of NHL teams. Uh, he was a terrific second line center, uh, but it was so much harder to win. The games were tougher, the series were tougher, and, and we had to rely on one another. And it was really a group effort. You know, no two, three, four guys carried us. Our power play didn't carry us. And it wasn't a 35% efficient you know, like it was in Denver. So because it was hotter, because I was a year older, because I was closer to the end, the and, and I had family here, yeah. the appreciation was greater. So let's talk about that. Well, one, the appreciation, and I want to talk about the leadership role too, because that's definitely, you kind of see that now. We saw that in the beginning with, with the Golden Eagles with like Rich Trudemass. Yeah. But before I get to that, I really want to touch on coming here and having Matt your brother yeah. uh, that lived here. And like, how nice was that to come to Utah and have the opportunity to see your brother again? Cause you guys have been, you know, yeah. basically separated for years. We had, um, so when Matt graduated college, for those that don't know his life story, 
when he graduated from college, UMass Amherst back in Massachusetts, he went to Europe with a bunch of his buddies. Did the Euro rail thing, traveled around, stayed in hostels. They didn't have any money, so they were just going to see the world before they had to settle into some kind of nine to five situation. Go to work, met some other Americans while they were in Europe. They were Californians, so they changed their return flight to LA instead of Boston so they could hang around and party with those guys in California before they came back to Boston. Then he started coming east, he got as far as Salt Lake and ran out of money. <laughs> okay. So he settled in Salt Lake, he got a job, I think up on Snowbird, yep. I think it was his first job. Ended up meeting Allison, and next thing you know, his life was out here. That's funny, because that's not the way he told us he ended wow. up here, but yeah, he said he came here intentionally to ski. But I like your version <laughs> a lot better. No, I think mine's closer to the truth, but, uh, but well, you know. Horse's, well, horse's mouth, I guess you have to believe him. One of the of things me. I know Matt told me about you, because um, you were gonna, I, I got to play with you or, or almost play with you in a tournament where we were the Boston Hobos. <laughs> and that was, uh, anyway, we made some hobo jerseys. It was a lot of fun. And he was telling me about you and how uh, you were the last pick of the draft. Yeah. And yeah. I don't think the NHL does enough to, like, acknowledge that. Do, do you think, what do you think looking back on being, you know, they call it Mr. Irrelevant in NFL and, and look at, They've got one of the best quarterbacks in the NFL right, is right. Mr. Irrelevant. Right, I know. And, uh, and there are those that have, that have written about the fact that I had a pretty decent lengthy NHL career, was a pretty good player to go that late in the draft. So at that time, there were 21 teams in the league. There were 10 rounds, and I went 210. And uh, some people refer to me as Mr. Irrelevant. I know it's just a football term, but <laughs> it makes its point. But... Um, you know, you have to have a lot of a lot of great people around you, a lot of support. You know, my first pro coach, when I left college a year early to turn pro, because I thought I was ready to step right in the NHL, but I wasn't. I had to learn to become a pro. I had to learn how to play 80-plus games a year. Oh. I had to learn how to play with men. You know, I had to learn how to value the puck and not turn it over when I was trying to be risky. So there's so much you have to learn as a, as a 20-year-old trying to play in the NHL. And my first year in the American Hockey League, for the most part, was for a guy named Tom McVie. And if I don't have him, if I don't have him in my life at that time, in that particular place, on that learning curve, I don't make it. You know, I'm just another guy that got drafted late. So, yeah. yeah, there's been important people along the way that help you get there, but, you know, it takes a lot of inner fortitude. We call it Sisu in Finnish. Okay. My mother was Finnish, okay. so people would love that I use that phrase. Um, and so I had that, and I had, you know, I wanted to prove that I could play. And you gotta remember that but the NHL at that time was about 2 or 3% American. No. And there weren't Europeans, there weren't Russians, you know. There was the wall, there was the Iron Curtain. You know, no, nobody was coming over here to play in the NHL from that part of the world. So it was predominantly Canadian league. And if you were American, you were a minority and you got treated like one. And it was hard, it was challenging. You know, you had the 80 Olympic team, Miracle, that helped knock down some barriers. Uh, Bobby Copper that went from high school in Boston to the NHL directly, scored 33 goals his first year as an 18-year-old. That helped knock down some barriers and say, maybe these Americans can play. So all that stuff kind of added up to me getting an opportunity. And then are you doing the work? Are you preparing to meet that opportunity when you get it? Excel at it. And that's what happened for me. So maybe a late bloomer, but when opportunity came my way, I was ready for it. Yeah, that's amazing. I love that story. And then you come to Utah and do you... Do you realize right away what an impact Matt had had on this no, market? No. Do you I, get it now? Like I, I, no, I didn't, and, and this is the truth. I didn't realize until his funeral. Oh. The outpouring of love and admiration and respect and thanks and gratitude that everybody that came in contact with him shared with me, finally I realized what a life he had out here, the impact he had on hockey in Utah and Salt Lake, Amateurs, you know, I mean, he, he, he officiated in professional oh, yeah. leagues and just his passion. And I see it in his kids. I see it in Daniel. I see it in Sam. And I didn't realize until I came out. You know, I would come out and visit for a long weekend. And hockey was the furthest thing from my mind because it was the summer. Right. You know, I was playing golf and whatever we were doing, golfing and just hanging out. But not until, you know, I met the Randy Lewis's of the world. Yeah. Did I realize how impactful he was? It's funny because uh, when I watch a Boston Bruins game and I hear you get on and do your color, I hear Matt. <laughs> and, you know, you talk about brothers that look, look alike or families look alike. You guys sound a lot alike. Yeah. And to me, I might get emotional here, yeah. but that triggers all the the 
talks that I had with your brother. And, you know, there were times I, when I started playing here, I was 15. So I was still young enough to be pretty stupid, but I was also old enough to know better in a lot. And I was getting in the game really late. And Matt had to set me straight a lot of times on the ice, off the ice, sure. phone calls, whatever he had to. Uh, and, and it wasn't just me. It was my entire age group. And we had some guys go NCAA. And much to Matt's surprise, I, I was one of the guys getting looked at. But again, that stuff doesn't happen. The, the guys that get out of here then, and then you, you talked about Randy Lewis, and obviously that turns into Trevor Lewis. Right. But that doesn't happen without Matt not only officiating and setting up leagues, but also taking the time, like you said, yeah. and being that person. Um, so yeah, it's just, it's just amazing to me. And his impact still, like you see it with Daniel, and yeah. his and, impact and still. Had, and I would add to that, he had a way about him. You know, even if he was trying to educate someone on the game or educate someone in life on how to conduct themselves, yeah. you know, within a hockey environment, he could do that without that person being offended or feel like he was being talked down to or, you know, and he, he learned that from my dad. My dad was like that. We were lucky to have a father that, was, that, that, that knew how to handle people in the best way, you know, you know, and, and I try to be the same way. And, and, you know, Matt and I were very close because we were we were one of seven. Five boys, two girls. So the two oldest brothers, John and George, they did everything together. And then the next two brothers were Matt and Andrew, and we did everything together. And when we played two versus two, you know what the teams were. Right? <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I was Matt's best man when he got married to Allie, and he was my best man, best man when I got married to Diane. So we just we just had a you know we had a bond that close brothers had, you know, yeah. and I was lucky enough that I was on a plane with the Bruins. We were taxiing to fly to California when the end was near for Matt. And the Bruins were gracious enough that when we landed in California, they had a car waiting for me. They took me to the, to the main terminal. They had booked me a flight to Salt Lake City oh. so I could see Matt. Well, and when I was on that, and I, when I had to go back to work, that's when he passed away. So I was able to see him. That's amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. I didn't mean One to turn this. One more share. One more share yeah, we had. That's, that's amazing. I didn't yeah. mean to turn this emotional. No, not at all. Um, but that's cool, and it was cool to hear the LA Kings were the same way with Daniel. Yep. Um, yep. And it was so much fun to see Matt and Randy Lewis just get to live that year of yeah. being so proud yeah. to be an NHL father. Yeah, and I and I still you know remember standing shoulder to shoulder with both those guys when you know when both their sons were playing for the Kings and. It was phenomenal, and, and both of them earned it. They really did. They earned they earned the right to be there. There was no gifts there. No. Obviously, with Trev, the year the career that he's had, and still going, seventeen years in, or whatever it is, you know, like, twenty two games away from his thousandth game. <laughs> it's phenomenal. It's phenomenal. <laughs> and it, it with Daniel, I I coached Daniel since he was little. He came to my camps every year, and and I, I tell people this, and you talk talking about being drafted last, and talking about these little challenges, um, but. Daniel wasn't great until like 15, 16. He was always good, but he wasn't great. Yeah. And I think that's when his drive kicked in. He was always going because he's yeah. Matt's kid yeah. or whatever. But you saw that switch, you know, you saw it click and yeah. you saw him all of a sudden. You could hear it in his, in his stride. Yeah. You could hear when he got great. Yeah. And those challenges, I think, are what made him better because he was late getting out too, right? Right, right. And, and having not lived here, I don't know all the challenges you know, and all the obstacles and the level of play. You know, I know players are coming to the NHL from all over, from all over, certainly from all over parts of the United States, you know. How difficult it was for a guy like Daniel Trevor, like, to get the necessary challenge, right? Yeah. In order to make sure they're reaching their their, their best case, you know what I mean, their, their best uh, talent level. So I, I'm impressed, anybody from that era that's now playing professional hockey, I think is incredibly impressive. So what do you think that's, the NHL is going to do for this market now? You've been around long enough. You've seen what happened with Vegas. You've seen, I mean, I think you were around like even when San Jose came into the market yeah. and Phoenix came in. Sure. You've seen it happen. What do you expect to happen here now? Well, I think the model is already out there when you start talking about the most recent expansions. And even though this really isn't an expansion, right? Yeah. Uh, what the league has done to support you know, the grassroots levels in those markets, whether it's Vegas, Seattle, take a look at that, the hockey that's that's growing in those markets and how quickly it's growing. I, I expect the same kind of support from the league here. 
they want this to be a home run. It will be a home run. It took them a long time to admit they made a mistake hanging around down there in Arizona for as long as they did. Uh, which still a chance to go back there within yeah. the next five years, and, and it probably will happen. But I expect the league to really support what's happening here. I think the players will be all in to help grow what's happening at the grassroots level. They'll get involved with their youth hockey, whether it's through their own kids, you know, if there are any, because I know they're a pretty young team. But uh, yeah, and I just think, uh, hey, look, I was 8 10 when the Bruins won the Cups in 70 and 72. You know, MDC rinks were going up left and right because of the Boston Bruins. Yeah. You know, now you got the Utah HC. I expect the same kind of growth in this market. So let's analyze the team now. We didn't get an expansion. We got a group of young studs, like you said. We, yeah. You know, to, to get Cooleys and Gunthers and, and Clayton Keller, and yeah. to, get a, to get handed that, that's way better than an expansion draft. Exactly. I feel like we uh, won the lottery in so many ways with ownership, with getting this team, and then with the players we've got. Uh, you think Utah's going to be dangerous this year, or do you think they're still a couple years out? Well, I think they'll be a tough out this year. I think, I think they'll be a tough out every game. I think they'll be playing meaningful games when you start talking late February, March, April. Uh, do they have enough to be a postseason team? Who knows? Who knows? You know, I was part of a Devils team. The Devils had never made the playoffs, and this is 87-88. We had to go 12-3 and three down the stretch to tie for the last spot and get in on a tiebreaker, and we go all the way to Game 7 of the conference final. So I know what can happen with teams that may not have the track record or the resume. You come together as a group, great things can happen because they're super talented, you know. Uh, they have some, they have a base. They know their paychecks are coming. You know, no, no. They have a rink that they're proud of. They're, they have a home base that they're proud of. They have a fan base that's, that's going to grow and get behind them. And it's going to be exciting. And, and that leads to better play, more consistent play. Do they have enough in the key areas, goaltending, defense, defending? They have obviously proved they can score goals. They got yeah. immense talent, <laughs> yeah. you know, speed, skill. I mean, it's impressive. And it's going to be an exciting game, certainly tonight. Uh, I don't know. I, it's so early. What, five games in? You can't really True. handicap. You know, what's going to happen out, out west, but I know they'll be a tough out all year long. Tell me about your Bruins this year. Uh, Swayman's under contract now. We, yeah. got, we finally get that behind us. All that drama's yeah. behind us. Yeah. Phenomenal goaltending. Uh, you, we, we know what you have on forward and defense, so that's, that's no secret. We're not guessing with, with Boston. Yeah. Um, how do you think the team's going to come together? Again, five games to, to tell. But. Yeah, yeah, small sample set. Uh, here are the things the Bruins are dealing with right now that need to be worked out and ironed out in order to be the team. They certainly have the foundation of the team that they want to be. A lot of what they do in their own zone is different from what teams do across the league. It's more of a hybrid defense, not a zone, not man on man. It's a lot of communication, a lot of switches. And, and sometimes it's a zone that you know turns into a man on man, you know, that kind of thing. So you need good sentiment, right? Yep. And they've had turnover at that position. So even though you have established guys playing that position, it's new to them. You know, whether it's a Lindholm or it's a uh, Kastelik, or if you have one of the guys that were playing wing last year that's playing center this year, whether it's a Frederick or a Geeky, or maybe it's a young kid like Patra, you know, Charlie Coyle is really the only guy that's been in the system right. and knows what he's doing. So that's been a learning process. So there's been some good and some bad, and it's cost them some points, particularly against Florida. Uh, also, they have a new goaltender as far as the, the, the tandem is concerned. You know, I mean, pick your poison if you were playing the Bruins the last, whatever, four years when you had Omar and, and Sway. Uh, so now it's Sway's net. I think it'll be a 70-30 split in terms of percentage of games, yep. games played. Um, but Corpocello's a, a competent goalie who will make the saves he needs to make when he plays for a good defensive team. I think his numbers will be just fine. And he'll help you win games. So center position, goaltending position. I think they're really good on defense. The addition of Zadorov is going to really help them. Makes everybody a little bigger, a little heavier, a little stronger, a little tougher. That helps. Peak's going to help in that area too. You know, he just plays a simple game defense. You can pair him with just about any one of the left D, you know, let that left D play offense. But to this point, the D's involved in their offense, which is something they've, they've been trying to grow. This kid, Laura, young kid, Charlie McAvoy, I'm waiting for him to blossom into a superstar. Not just a great player, yeah. but a superstar that can control the game. He's so much fun to watch. Yeah, and and then you got, you know, then you got Brandon Carlo, who's, you know, 6'5", can skate, great defending <laughs> yeah. player. And then Hampus Lindholm, who sometimes leaves you wanting more because he's got it. He's got all the tools, you know. And if he plays simple and tries not to do too much, he can be a highly effective player. Two years ago, in the absence of McAvoy, he was like a Norris candidate. Like, he has the skill. So I'm not worried about what's on the back end. Up front, 
Their fourth line's been the best line through the first five games. Oh, that's interesting. They've been consistent. They've played exactly the way Montgomery wants to play. Fast, intense, simple. Uh, pucks to the net, play the low high game, transfer the puck behind the net, side to side, make the team work. Uh, he's used them in every situation, protecting leads, starting periods, changing momentum, whatever it might be. Statistics, they're great. They're plus minus, they're production. Uh, so no changes there. They got to figure out the second and third lines. They got to figure out who can play inside the top six, who can play with Coyle and Marshawn on the right side. And it's been a revolving door already through five games, trying to find somebody that will get some chemistry with those guys to give them a solid top six. You know, you got Lindholm between Zach and Pasternak. They like that. They seem to think the game the same way. They're yeah. good. They're only going to get better. That second line is a key. And then the third line. Is Potra going to be here all year? Can he play center in the NHL and drive a third line offense? And they wanted to get bigger and tougher and stronger in the offseason. And the acquisitions, you know, they're, they're the tallest and heaviest team in the league, if you can believe it. And I think the eighth youngest on top of that. Oh, wow. so, so they changed their roster. And what you're seeing through five games is that change and trying to build their team, build their team, get better every game. Their best game was their most recent game. So that's a good sign. They beat Colorado 5-3 the first game of this road trip. They played really good for 40 minutes, got a little too conservative in the third period, kind of let uh, Colorado get back in it with a couple of foul play goals. But yeah, it's a work in progress, but I, I'm still very bullish on this group. Well, it's been a lot of fun. Uh... It's fun having Jim Montgomery coach, too, another yeah. former Grizzly. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. very cool. Well, Andy, uh, I can't thank you enough for taking the time to talk to us. And, uh, Pleasure. Good luck all year. And we hope thank to see you back.